starts right now. All right, we're starting off with a live look out at the Alamo City. A little warmer than how we started yesterday, but fog still in and around the Alamo City. We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. But for now, good morning. It is 6 o'clock. It is Sunday, February 5th. Joined here with Alyssa Cole. Good yes, morning. Yes, good morning, Max. I'm so excited to be here. Good morning, San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> so happy to have you here. Yes. But I do want to give a shout out because it is... National Weather Persons Day. Oh, well, there you go. They make national days for everything, <laughs> yeah. don't they? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we follow up Groundhog Day. Yeah, I'm, you guys I'm are glad. great. I'm glad we do follow that. I up. think uh, Justin Horn's <laughs> a little upset he wasn't in front of Punxsutawney Phil. I see. But you guys do a great job, too. Well, thank you. Yeah, but you are right. I mean, there is some fog out there this morning for some areas. Now, around downtown San Antonio, it's generally clear. But you go out to New Braunfels, visibility down to two miles, visibility down to three miles in Pleasanton. Even in Del Rio, we're seeing some fog early this morning, visibility down to four miles. Temperatures on the chilly side. It's 41 in San Antonio, upper 30s in the Hill Country, and upper 30s out west toward Del Rio as well. Here's a look at the visibility on the map, and you can see that it's particularly low the further east you go, out towards Seguin, Gonzales, San Marcos, and the further south you go, closer to Pleasanton as well. But today is going to end up being a beautiful day for us. Us. We're going to see that fog lift around mid morning when it will be in the 50s, around noon in the 60s, and for the afternoon high temperature, sunny and 72. A gorgeous, gorgeous weekend. Hard to believe that it was just about five days or so that we were dealing with ice around San Antonio. So a beautiful day today. In the week ahead, we do have an opportunity for some rain and a double dose of cold fronts. I've got those details in a few minutes. Alyssa, Max. Thank you, Sarah. Governor Greg Abbott issuing a disaster declaration for seven Texas counties, all impacted by recent severe weather. So these areas experiencing significant damage over the last week. More counties could still be added depending on damage assessments. Now Abbott says the declaration would allow the state to provide assistance to those affected, also encouraging families to report any damage that they see. Now, if you're interested in learning more about this, we have all the details right now. Just head to KSAT.com. Now to a story we've been following through the week. A recovery mission in the Atlantic Ocean after the U.S. military shot down that Chinese surveillance balloon. Yes, the government now hoping to recover as much of the surveillance equipment as much as possible. Here's ABC's Derek Dennis with the latest. A dramatic scene unfolding 60 to 65,000 feet in the air over the Atlantic Ocean. All of a sudden the whole house just shook that it was like a loud boom. I ran outside and that's when I saw all the neighbors and then you just saw the smoke. Navy and Coast Guard ships setting up a security perimeter as teams work to recover what's left of the payload from that balloon. They're going to be looking for the sensor package that was underneath that balloon. Remember that the administration said that this was a spy balloon. And so what was being used to spy? Was it cameras? Were there signal intelligence capabilities? The balloon with a payload the size of about three buses traveled for days, first entering American airspace over Alaska before heading southeast over Montana, Missouri and the Carolinas. Officials say they collected intelligence from the balloon as it drifted at times over sensitive military sites. The mission began just after 1 p.m. Eastern Saturday, the FAA closing nearby airspace. I ordered the Pentagon to shoot it down on Wednesday as soon as possible. They decided that the best time to do that was as it got over water outside within our within 12 mile limit. It successfully took it down. On Friday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken postponed his trip to China set for next week. But the real question here is why the Chinese decided to deliberately provoke the U.S. to go into sovereign U.S. airspace just before the first high-level meeting between two senior officials in years. Derek Dennis, ABC News, New York. And another balloon similar to the one that the U.S. took down yesterday. Well, this other balloon spotted in at least two Latin American countries this week. Colombian media reporting sightings of the balloon flying at least 70,000 feet over the South American country's airspace. Also reports that there was a balloon flying over Costa Rica. Could have been the same one, though. Neither the Colombian nor Costa Rican governments have issued any confirmation or official statements so far. 
Now to serious train derailment that caught fire is still burning in Ohio southeast of Cleveland. Hundreds of families near the scene have not been able to get access to their homes. Fire officials say the train was carrying chemicals and some of those chemicals are being leaked into a nearby water stream. The area is still very dangerous. Um, we are not allowing any of our people in that area it's still to this point. Now there is some good news. There are no readings of health risk in the area for anything airborne. Now to the near chaos at the Austin Bergstrom International Airport, the National Transportation Safety Board calling it a possible runway incursion and overflight involving planes from Southwest and from FedEx. The FAA states that FedEx cargo airplane was actually trying to land in Austin yesterday morning. It was forced to change course at the last minute after a second plane was cleared to depart from the same runway. And this all happened just before their cargo plane was about to land. An air traffic controller gave the go ahead for an airplane operated by Southwest to take off. The FAA and NTSB says that they're still investigating the situation, making sure it does not happen again. Remember, a similar close call was averted at JFK Airport last month. An American Airlines plane crossed the runway while a Delta Airlines Boeing 737 was preparing to take off. Now to politics, the Democratic National Committee changing up its course and approving a plan to shake up the 2024 presidential primary calendar. So this new plan would effectively demote longtime early voting states like Iowa and New Hampshire. South Carolina, if this plan goes into effect, would hold the first primary on February 3rd. But still, significant questions remain about how this new order will be implemented. Here is CNN's Ariel Metropolis with the latest. With the bang of a gavel. The eyes have it, and the report on the Rules and Bylaws Committee has been adopted. Democrats are set to move forward with a new presidential primary calendar. Here's a reality. No one state should have a lock on going first. In an effort to amplify the voices of minority voters, on Saturday, the Democratic National Committee voted to approve a plan to change the party's 2024 primary, bumping South Carolina to first place and stripping New Hampshire of its first in the nation status, despite pleas from Granite State Democrats. We are frustrated because as many times as we say it, no one seems to listen when we say that this will only hurt President Biden in our purple battleground state. They argue that booting New Hampshire from the top spot could jeopardize critical swing voters. Our first concern is to make sure that uh, we have a successful November 2024. But due to a state law requiring the Granite State hold its primary first, New Hampshire Democratic Chair Ray Buckley says they simply can't follow the changes. We're hoping that they'll understand uh, the situation that we have. New Hampshire Democrats have until June 3rd to come up with an agreement with the DNC. And even if the party threatens to revoke delegates, Buckley says they'll be ready to deal with any consequences because no matter what, Granite Staters will vote first. We are going to have the first in the nation primary. All right, so that was Ariel Metropolis reporting. And so if the DNC and New Hampshire Democrats don't come to a consensus, voters there could find themselves at the polls as early as January. Okay, right now the time is 6.08 and it's 41 degrees outside. All right, speaking of which, let's take a live look out at the Alamo City. Yesterday morning, you were out and about. Absolutely, and it cold. was freezing. It was yes, <laughs> very cold. So cold out there. <laughs> Hopefully we see those temps warm up throughout the day. We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. All right, so we were talking about some of that record-breaking cold front that the Northeast is dealing with. Negative 108, now possibly the new national record for the lowest wind chill ever. So you're from Midwest? I'm from the Midwest, Michigan, and I can tell you that is probably painfully cold. I oh can't even goodness. imagine. Can, can you even like survive outside? That might be a stupid right. question. Right. I mean, no, not unless you have uh, all the equipment to protect your warmth, because I mean, yeah. yeah. That'll that'll suck suck away <laughs> any of your your heat. <laughs> I mean, I gotta say though, it, it really puts into perspective the last week that we've been dealing with. Yes, it was right. super cold. It was miserable to deal with, and some people, you know, still north of us still don't have power. But to look at negative 108 on the screen. Yeah. That's terrifying. Well, right, and, exactly. and that part of the country, I'll show you here in a second. They're actually warming up. 
but they're still below zero. Wow. <laughs> I know, yeah, absolutely. So we're not going to see any kind of very cold weather anytime yeah. soon here <laughs> in San Antonio. And I think after last week's ice, we deserve a perfect weather day like today. But if you are stepping outside, you are going to have to worry about a little bit of fog, at least for another hour or two. Here's a look outside right now. If you squint, you can actually see some fog here on the horizon starting to form. So uh, there will be areas of fog this morning. At the airport, though, we're seeing perfect 10 visibility, but it's 41 degrees cold out there this morning. Nice chill in the air. It's even freezing in Kerrville this morning. 37 in Hondo, 40 in Uvalde, 39 in Del Rio, 39 in New Braunfels, 44 in Gonzales, and good morning in Pleasanton. It's 41 degrees. Here's a look at the visibility where the fog is out there. Visibility down to a quarter of a mile in Austin and down to three quarters of a mile in New Braunfels. So if you're traveling along 35 in the next hour or so, you're going to want to use those low beams. Uh, we are seeing plenty of areas of fog, even out west toward Del Rio, visibility limited to about four miles. Let's take a closer look around San Antonio, though, and you can see that for the north part of the county, generally not really seeing much of an impact from the fog, but down at Stinson, visibility is four miles, visibility is less than half a mile in Seguin and down to a quarter of a mile in Gonzales. Showing you the future cast here, because through about nine o'clock in the morning, that's when we could continue to see some fog. After that, the fog is going to dissipate and we're going to have a beautiful sunny day. Around lunch, we'll have sunshine, temperatures in the 60s, and in the afternoon, totally sunny skies around the San Antonio metro area and around most of South Central. Texas. Here's a look at highs in your neighborhood. The average high temperature is 66 degrees. It's going to be 72 in San Antonio, so a little bit warmer than average. Yeah, we went from ice on Tuesday and Wednesday to the 70s today. That is a true Texas weather pattern right there. 73 in Hondo, it'll be 71 in Converse, 73 in Nixon Smiley, 71 in, in Kerrville, and 73 in Bandera. Here's a look at your KSAT 12 hour forecast. Again, patchy fog through about nine o'clock this morning. We'll be in the 40s. As soon as we see that sun, temperatures are gonna warm up. We'll be in the 50s by 10, 64 around noon, mostly sunny skies, southwest winds at about five to 10 miles per hour. And in the afternoon, we'll be in the 70s. It's gonna get pretty cool tonight too so if you have Sunday night plans grab the jacket with you as you head out the door. Now dew points are relatively low right now. We're looking at dew points in the 30s and 40s. That's comfortable. Dew points in the 30s and 40s doesn't feel very humid outside but watch what happens in the coming days. Tomorrow, Monday and Tuesday our dew points are going to steadily rise. By Tuesday it's going to be downright humid and then take a look at that. A big drop in the humidity. Tuesday into Wednesday and once again on Thursday. We've got a double dose of cold fronts heading our way this week and that is going to bring us an opportunity for some rain at times. I'll tell you about that in a second, but first I want to take a look at the weather setup across the nation. So as you can see, it's pretty quiet across Texas Central Plains. Here's that cold core of Arctic air that's been affecting New England. Temperatures there still well below zero in Caribou, Maine, but we are going to see that cold core of Arctic air move on off to the east and they'll finally start to thaw out. Here's our next rainmaker currently bringing rainfall to California, parts of the Pacific Northwest, even snowfall for parts of Nevada. As we look ahead, this low is is going to be bringing a chance for rain Tuesday and especially Tuesday night with some lingering showers on Wednesday as well. This is the timeline for you for rainfall Tuesday, Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. Coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about rainfall potential in the next uh, half hour, hour here, uh, but take a look at what this does to temperatures. So we're warmer tomorrow, 75. We're cloudy with some light rain throughout the day on Tuesday. Then that front moves through Tuesday night, brings some showers and storms. Then Wednesday and Thursday, our highs are only going to be in the 60s. That second front arrives Thursday night into Friday. Our mornings will be in the 30s and afternoons will be in the upper 50s and low 60s. So yes, a lot cooler by the week's end, but nothing like what we had to deal with this past week for us. And there are going to be some happy rain gauges Tuesday, Tuesday night and Wednesday. I'll have a look ahead to those rainfall potential coming up in the next half hour, guys. All right, Sarah Spivey, thank you so much. Time now, 617, 41 degrees out. After the break, the Houston Texans are on their third head coach in three seasons, but now they're asking a former defensive star to turn their team around. We'll hear from him in just a few moments. Let's take a look at those lotto numbers. Pick three, five, zero, one, fireball two. Daily four, five, zero, nine, three, fireball two. And your cash five, one, four, 17, 32, 33. 
Lotto, Texas, 16, 26, 30, 31, 37, 44. And then this is the big one. Well, yesterday. Ah, oh, there's a whole thing. It's up like <laughs> $727 million. Regardless, Powerball numbers. 2, 8, 15, 19, 58, big number 10. Power play 2. Good luck. We'll be right back. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good morning. Welcome back. And how about them Cowboys? So just days after the Cowboys said goodbye to Kellen Moore, they're saying hello to Brian Schottenheimer. He's going to be the new offensive coordinator under head coach Mike McCarthy. McCarthy still expected to make the calls next season. Schottenheimer, son of the former NFL coach Marty Schottenheimer. At 49 years old, Brian spent last season as a consultant with the Cowboys, so nothing crazy to give him the title of OC. He was the Jacksonville Jaguars passing game coordinator in 2021. Previous experiences with the Seahawks, the Colts, and the Jets. Going to our other pro team, the Houston Texans, dealing with their own coaching change after two straight seasons with two different head coaches. After David Coley and Lovey Smith, Houston now turned into D'Amico Ryans. Remember, Ryans, a former Texan himself, star player, drafted 33rd overall in the 06 NFL Draft. During his time as a player, Ryans played for a bunch of different head coaches, and he was with two of them during his first jobs, now, Gary Kubiak and Chip Kelly. Now, we asked him what impact that they had on his mentality heading into a first-year head coaching position. I take things that I learned from all these men, and that's how I feel like you build an organization, right? You build a first-class organization, right? You protect your players, be a great teacher, motivate them, and do everything to be adaptable, to change, and make sure we have the best things for our players when it comes to sports science and technology. All right, so D'Amico signing a six-year contract. That does imply that he's going to be getting at least one year to build some success. We know the last two Texans head coaches, they haven't lasted very long, so optimistic for D'Amico. He's been on one of my teams. I'm excited to see him thrive, and I'm excited to see this Texans organization start to get some wins. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Yes, I'm excited, too. We want to hear more about the Texans, so. Absolutely. All right, time now, 623, 41 degrees out. All right, just ahead, nine-year-old in the Midwest is now a high school graduate. We'll look at his journey and what comes next. This morning, a nine-year-old getting a high school diploma, earning the high school diploma. Yes, that is just so impressive. I'm excited hearing about his story. It's one case for one boy from Pennsylvania. He's nine years old. He graduated from Reach Cyber Charter School in Harrisburg. David took classes virtually from his home, and he says he loves computer and science programming. Now, David's parents have advanced degrees, but raising a young son with extraordinary intellectual gifts is challenging. Challenging. Like he's a nine year old with a brain that just have the capacity to understand and comprehend a lot of concept that's beyond his years and sometimes beyond my understanding. I want to be an astrophysicist and I wanted to study black holes and supernova. Look at him go. I love the outfit. Oh, yes. He has so much energy. Congratulations to him. David is also a member of Minta. For now, his family is looking at colleges and universities <laughs> across the nation to try to find one that's the right fit. I'm guessing maybe MIT. Yeah, that's actually a really good guess. Oh, wow. Good for David. Yes, He's killing it. Absolutely. Oh, my God. To hear his parents even be like, his brain is more, you know, elegant than ours. I was like, all right, let's calm down. You'll, you'll both oh, have no. advanced degrees. All right. Nice. Time now. This is amazing. Time now. Just about 628, 41 degrees out. Up next at 630, we're checking in on those power outages across the hill country and how many homes could still be in the dark this morning. And right now we're taking a live look at the roads. We're looking at Southeast Military Area. We can see a little traffic happening there, but it looks clear on the roads. We'll be right back. Good morning, welcome back, and happy weekend. Just after 6.30 this morning, it is Sunday, February 5th. We are joined by the Alyssa Cole. Yes. 
Yes, Max, you are just the best. All the energy. How are you I mean, doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing excellent. Better working with you and Sarah. Oh. I mean, just enjoying myself. <laughs> I mean, how could we not look? After the week of weather we had, yesterday you were out at the Heritage Parade. Yes, How'd the it Heritage go? Parade. It was nice. My first uh, Heritage Parade cattle run. I saw the Longhorns. I, I understand now. They're beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it was a great time. It was a great time. And here's the thing. It started to look beautiful once we got past the fog yesterday morning. Oh, yeah. There was some more intense fog yesterday morning and also it, it's it's pretty chilly and you know this morning we are seeing some areas of fog and chilly conditions as well that fog is just not quite as wi widespread here's a look at the visibility now if you're in New Braunfels right now the fog is thick visibility down to a quarter of a mile in New Braunfels and down to less than half a mile in Seguin as well you'll notice that the fog is more intense east of San Antonio and south in Pleasanton visibility down to two miles too however once we start to see the sunrise, the fog is going to start to dissipate and we're going to see temperatures rise. But if you're planning on heading out in the next hour or so, maybe early mass, early church, uh, or just going out to start your Sunday morning early, know that it's going to be cold and you're going to want to use those low beams. Temperatures this morning in the 30s and 40s, 36 in Bernie, 39 in New Braunfels. Good morning in Seguin where it's 39 degrees, 37 in Rio Medina below freezing in Kerrville this morning, but just so 33 in Comfort and 33 in Bandera. Here's a look at today's forecast. I love when the temperature bars start turning yellow and red because that means it's going to be warm in the afternoon. We're going to be looking at high temperature of 72 under mostly sunny skies. Southwest winds 5 miles per hour. All right, here's what we're going to talk about this beautiful day today. But coming up in the forecast, temperatures this week are going to be a bit up and down. 70s today and tomorrow, but cooler during the middle of the week, especially noticeable in the mornings. And we've got to talk about a chance for rain, which many of us are excited about because we could use some rain in these drought conditions. Tuesday through Wednesday. That's our window for rain. I'll give you those details coming up in just a bit. Alyssa, Max. Thank you, Sarah. Well, happening right now, lights slowly coming back on in Comal County. Now, PEC outage map. Now, it says 1500 on the screen, but I'm checking the live results right now. Still more than a thousand outages. Here's the good news. 98% of meters for PEC do have power. Now, that is still a lot of people, a lot of homes, a lot of businesses being impacted but it's a lot less than what we saw in the last 48 hours. Remember, Thursday into Friday, more than 4,000 people still stuck in the dark. And happening right now, lots of people in the Hill Country and our surrounding areas, they're still cleaning up in the aftermath of these winter storms. So, Comal County has actually set up a place where you can drop off some of the brush, and you can do so for free. Until February 11th, anyone who lives in the area can bring their brush to the Comal County Recycling Center, that is 281 Resource Drive in New Braunfels. Meanwhile, the cleanup continues after ice covered the hill country earlier this week. Camila Juarez stopped by Bull Verde to see how people there are dealing with the cleanup. This is what the streets of Bull Verde sound like. Chainsaws cutting branches, hauling leaves, and branches snapping. The damage side of it has is, is been you know, a lot to deal with for sure. The ice from the freeze earlier this week weighed down tree branches, causing many to crack. Some branches landed on power lines, causing outages across the hill country. The Perdinalis Electric Cooperative outage map shows crews are still working to restore power north of Bull Verde. There's so much more damage involved in that and what the ice can do versus just the snow. As the lights come back on, Bulverde homeowners like Jimmy Hayden are working around the clock to clean up the mess. So working pretty much all day uh, yesterday and it's been all day today cutting and hauling and, and dealing with it. Cleaning up a large yard with at least a dozen trees is a big job, but friends and neighbors work together, sharing trailers and providing an extra hand. This is how Texans are, you know, we just help each other out. Walker Hayden says they started Thursday. Finding the right equipment was the first challenge. Home Depot was low on tree trimmers and chainsaws. It was like a madhouse. There was people everywhere. And luckily me and him got to pick up the last two that they had on the shelves. After two full days of cutting and compressing trees, Hardy says tomorrow they will wrap up and take the debris to a drop off site. Tree branches can be brought here to the Comal County Recycling Center. It's a temporary no fee drop off site that's going to be operational now until next Saturday. Camelia Juarez, Kesa 12 News. Right, this is the story we're continuing to follow on air and online. You can find the latest details on KSAT.com. Just look for the stories on our homepage.
Other stories we're following this morning. Five members of a family are in their final resting place after being killed in a crash in Kamal County. We've been following this story since the crash on January 22nd and all seven people died. A 12 year old girl is the sole survivor from that crash. Lee Waldman spoke with her now guardian and eldest brother who says he's going to make the best to do what he has to do and make his parents proud. Nancy Olivera Gonzalez, she she really loved to do party decorations. That was her side entrepreneur thing. But she was uh, she was my mom and my dad. Every father in one family seems almost impossible. Nearly two weeks after losing his mom, stepdad, two brothers, and younger sister, Hector Daniel Jaimes is honoring them. Christian, he has autism, but that didn't stop him. He's always happy, you know, you know, going around, saying hi to everyone. He's Diego. Um, he likes soccer, Roblox. Zia, we, we call her Julieta. Julieta. That's her middle name. Uh, she was like my mom in a way. Loved ones filled the chapels of the Castillo funeral home each holding on to one another as they mourned. Albertino Vera Gonzalez, having a stepdad, I was distant with him, but you know, over time we got to talk every now and then. So, you know, we, I, I, could, I could say he is my dad. 12 year old Mia Olvera Gonzalez is the sole survivor of the crash that killed everyone else in the car with her and the two people in the other vehicle. She's home from the hospital in a wheelchair and needs extensive physical therapy. Mia's a strong 12 year old girl, but I'll probably cry more than her and I'll tell her like, hey, it's it's okay to cry. I miss is her guardian now, promising to be mom and dad to her. He says he'll draw on their mom's memory and strength to get them through the hard times ahead. It's a long journey ahead, but I'm gonna get through it no matter no matter how hard it is, no matter how, how many bad days, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta do it for my family. Jaime says the Department of Public Safety is still investigating the crash and what caused it. According to their initial report, the driver of the other vehicle hit Jaime's family's car. Back to you. This morning, a family is waking up without a home after it was destroyed during a fire. Crews responded to the call yesterday morning on Kinmar Drive. That's not far from I-10 and East Houston Street. The fire is believed to have started in the bedroom before spreading to the attic. Everyone inside was able to make it out safely. The San Antonio Zoo is a staple of family-friendly fun around the Alamo City, and there are big changes on the way. That is why later this morning, leading us at 8 a.m. tomorrow, the CEO of the San Antonio Zoo joining us live. We're set to talk about new improvements to the zoo, new exhibits coming in the spring, and a timetable when we can see these new experiences. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, you can submit them right now. Just head to the leading essay section of KSAT.com. Then join us at 8 a.m. for the full conversation. Have you been to the San Antonio oh, no, Zoo? No, I haven't. Oh, it is amazing. I think some of this construction, I don't want to steal his thunder, I think some of it starts on Monday. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to talk to him. All right, time now, 639, 42 degrees out. The rodeo road trip is coming up fast for the San Antonio Spurs. Still ahead on GMSA, how the team's rookies are getting ready for it. And up next, more hotels allowing pets when you can go on vacation. Do you have a pet? I do. His name is Duke and he's just Shih Tzu. Oh, so <laughs> cute. We're going to check out which hotels will let Duke come oh, yeah. on down and uh, what you're going to need to do before you make a reservation. And taking a li live look outside, the city is looking beautiful right now. You can see that skyline and the sun should be coming up in just a bit. We'll be back. Good morning and welcome back. For so many of us, pets our family. Oh, yes, absolutely. And so when you have to go somewhere, is it heartbreaking when you have to leave oh, the pet behind? It's heartbreaking being here right now without him. I wish he could be here. Is he at the watching? Desk. Is he watching? He is watching. I nice. did leave the TV nice. on. Yes. <laughs> but there's good news. Recently, more hotels are becoming pet friendly, meaning you can bring your pet along more often. ABC's Faith Abube has the story. Love to travel crazy animal lover. Kim Salerno is the CEO and founder of Trips with Pets, a website where you can book your hotel directly, choosing from more than 50,000 pet-friendly accommodations across the U.S. and Canada. She says she has noticed an uptick in Americans traveling with their pets on vacation and business trips. People think of their pets differently than they did years ago. They don't call themselves pet owners anymore. Many are calling themselves pet parents because pets are 
part of the family. These days, Salerno says hotels are more accepting of pets. With nearly 70 percent of American households having at least one pet, the demand is there. They kind of needed to be more welcoming to four-legged guests. Hotel chains that allow pets include La Quinta, Motel 6, Red Roof Inn, and Kendallwood Suites. And just last year, some Hilton brands have opened their doors to furry travelers too. But before booking any pet-friendly hotel, it's important to check the pet policy, which can differ at each location. Just because a hotel allows pets, you really want to dig into, will they accept you and your entire pack, if that's the case. Salerno says you want to read the fine print, look for the nightly fees, pet weight limits, number of pets allowed, restrictions on certain dog breeds, and if pets are allowed to be left in the room unattended. With three large dogs of her own, Salerno says there are options out there. If I can find pet-friendly hotels to accommodate all three of my dogs, anybody can, and we can help them do it. <laughs> Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. Yeah, right. But what about cat-friendly hotels? Do you know there was a picture of a cat happen. on there? <laughs> <laughs> well, say, when you guys do travel, do you bring the pets with? How does this work? No. Uh, Nora is the, the queen of her castle. Okay. Our apartment. <laughs> so love it. Love she it. would be more uncomfortable, I think, if we were to move her around. I'll check Duke into a hotel here locally oh, so he can have, you know, a little vacation too, right? When I go on vacation. So that's how we normally do it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Duke and the dogs, a good day to be outside. Go for a Beautiful walk. Beautiful day to go for a walk out there, especially after the mid morning hours. We're going to see temperatures warm into the 60s by oh. lunch, and the afternoon will be in the 70s. You can see the first light of the day there off in the distance. You can also see some fog off in the distance too. We are seeing fog mainly primarily east of San Antonio and south of San Antonio, but there are areas of patchy fog. Winds are calm right now, 41 chilly degrees out at the airport. And here's a look at those temperatures in your neighborhood. 31 in Kerrville, 40 in Del Rio, 46 in Rock Springs. Good morning in New Braunfels, it's 41 degrees, 37 in Hondo, 42 in Kennedy, and 39 in Pleasanton. Here's a look at that fog right now. You can see out to the west there near Del Rio, visibility is continuing to go down. Visibility down to three miles in Del Rio. Quarter mile visibility in New Braunfels, Pleasanton, Gonzales, Let's go ahead and zoom into the metro area here. You can see visibility less than half a mile in Seguin. Now, whenever you get visibility less than half a mile, that's when you really want to use caution. So if you're in New Braunfels, Seguin, Pleasanton, Gonzalez, San Marcos, make sure to take your time to get to where you need to go today. Around San Antonio, the fog is really all, not all that bad, and we are going to see an all fog lift by about 10 o'clock this morning. Temperatures this morning in the 40s, but by 10 we'll be in the 50s. We'll see mostly sunny skies as early as noon. 64 and then in the afternoon 72 degrees for the high temperature. It's going to be a great day to go around, go for a walk, spend some time outdoors. Forget about last week's ice unless of course unfortunately you have to do a little yard work <laughs> from uh, the down trees and things like that. But it is going to be a beautiful, beautiful day with relatively low humidity as well. It'll be 77 in Eagle Pass, 77 in Catula. In Hondo it'll be 73, 71 in Kerrville and in Rock Springs, 75 in Del Rio, 72 in New Braunfels, 73 in Gonzales, will be about five degrees warmer than the average high temperature for the day today. Even warmer tomorrow when we'll be in the mid 70s, some 80s south of San Antonio possible too. But notice that by Wednesday, our highs will be in the 60s and by Friday and Saturday, closer to 60 degrees. We've got a double dose of cold fronts. First one moving through Tuesday night, second one moving through on Thursday. And it's also going to bring us an opportunity for some rain as well. Here's a look at where that system is right now producing lots of precipitation across parts of Idaho, uh, the Pacific Northwest, California. Take a look at your screen. We're going to walk you through the future cast here. That low is going to place itself in parts of West Texas by Tuesday. And by Tuesday in the morning, especially, we're going to have some areas of light drizzle and mist. During the day Tuesday, scattered light rain. Coverage should be about 30, 40 percent. Very light stuff. But by Tuesday night, with the approach of a cold front, looks like we'll have a little bit more organized activity, perhaps even a few rumbles of thunder flashes of lightning overnight Tuesday into Wednesday morning. This is a look at midnight on Wednesday, early Wednesday morning. Then behind that, we'll see our rain chances end and it'll get cooler too. As far as rainfall totals go, uh, the Texarkana area is where we're going to have the highest rainfall totals from this up to about two inches of rain around here in San Antonio. Once again, we're going to be on the tail end of things, so I would say widespread a tenth to half an inch of rainfall Tuesday through Wednesday morning. We'll take it. We need some rain. We're still under extreme and exceptional drought. 
and temperatures are going to take a tumble as well. So once again, that first front moves through on Tuesday. Highs will only be in the 60s for the remainder of the week. Thursday rodeo kicks off and uh, highs were going to be in the 60s, but those mornings will be in the 30s as well. So a bit of a mixed bag in the weather this week. We've got warm weather, cool weather, rain in the mix as well, but absolutely no ice, which is nice. <laughs> yes, that Always does wonderful. deserve a round of applause. No ice here in San Antonio. <laughs> that is a big win. And rodeo just around the corner. Couldn't ask for better weather. Oh, yes. It's going to be great. Absolutely. There. Time now 650, 42 degrees up. After the break, the San Antonio Spurs are hitting the road for the next nine games for the rodeo road trip. We'll look at where they're headed first in just moments. And taking a live look out at the roadways right now. Let's see, not much happening at 10 on Frio or Hackberry. There are some people, but in the distance, you can see that gorgeous sunrise. It's going to be a great day. We have a lot more to talk about, including the lottery. Speaking of which, let's take a look at those numbers. Pick three, five, zero, one, fireball two. Daily four, five, zero, nine, three, fireball two. Your cash five, one, four, 17, 32, 33. Lotto, Texas, 16, 26, 30, 31, 37, 44. And here you go, Powerball two, eight, 15, 19, 58, Powerball 10, power play two. Good luck, we'll be right back. Good morning and welcome back. So we already had the Western Heritage Parade and that means it's the unofficial start of the rodeo season. That also means the San Antonio Spurs bidding farewell to the AT&T Center. And they did so on Friday night, a hard fought loss to the Philadelphia 76ers. That loss marking eight straight for the silver and black, but that's not all doom and gloom. Don't worry, rookie Malachi Branham, well, he found his rhythm. He scored 48 points over the last two games. He's the first Spurs rookie to accomplish that since Yes, you guessed it, Tim Duncan back in 1998. So Branham and the rest of the rookies now getting their first taste of the rodeo road trip. It's a gauntlet of nine straight road games. They won't see San Antonio return home until March 2nd. So we asked the rookies how they felt about it. I don't know what to pack. Um, I know I'm probably gonna bring like two suitcases and just, just ask the guys, cause they, you know, they've been on a rodeo trip. So um, yeah, I don't know what to pack, but I'm probably going to start packing tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be exciting, though. It's going to be exciting. It will be exciting. And all the rookies have been playing so well. So looking ahead, Spurs hit the road for the nine-game rodeo road trip starting Monday, taking on the Bulls in Chicago, 7 p.m. Then they're going to Toronto, Detroit, Atlanta, just to name a few games over the next nine. So when we say rodeo road trip, this is it. And I really appreciate how he was so candid. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to pack. You're going everywhere, Chicago, all the way to Canada. So it's a lot to think about. It is. It is. Pack something warm. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and speaking of a lot to think about, a huge instant replay set for tonight. Larry Ramirez sitting down with UTSA quarterback Frank Harris. He's talking about everything from touchdowns to putting ketchup on his steak. It was a great interview. A little bit of it actually released on Twitter on Larry's Twitter account. Hilarious to watch. You're not going to want to miss it. Part one tonight, KSAT, 11 p.m. I was actually laughing while watching the, twi the tweets. So funny. I got to ask. I'm putting you on the spot. Do you put ketchup on your steak? I don't put ketchup nice. on my steak. All right. We're in a good place then. Yes. Yeah. Shame <laughs> on Frank. But that so much more tonight, 11 p.m. But for now, Time is 6.56, 42 degrees out. Now here's what's coming up next at 7 on Good Morning America. Good morning. Coming up on GMA, breaking overnight, China reacting to the U.S. shooting down that surveillance balloon crossing high above U.S. states. What U.S. officials are saying about next steps as the search for debris is underway. Also, remarkable rough sea rescue, the stunning footage of the Coast Guard pulling a man from a later discovered stolen boat just before it capsized, the details surrounding his arrest and what preceded the incident. Plus, red carpet rollout, music's biggest night upon us as we count down to tonight's Grammys, the expected favorites on and off the stage, and why all eyes are on Beyonce. It's all ahead here on GMA. After some morning fog, it's going to be beautiful and sunny. 72 for the high temperature today. We'll be looking at temperatures warming up into the mid 70s by tomorrow and a chance for rain Tuesday, especially Tuesday night into Wednesday, cooler to end the week. We'll see you back here right at eight. Bye. 
All right, taking a live look out at the Alamo City. Some fog to start your Sunday morning. Will it dissipate? How warm will it get? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. But for now, good morning. It is 8 o'clock. It is Sunday. It is February 5th. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. Alyssa Cole, thank you for starting yes, your morning with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Max. I'm loving it. Of course. So yesterday <laughs> yes. you were out the Western Heritage Parade and Cattle Drive. Yes, it was a little chilly start at first, but I had a great time. I saw the Longhorns. I saw the different groups. It was an excellent time. Fantastic. We're going to be talking <laughs> about rodeo and the rodeo road trip in just a bit. But you mentioned it was cold yesterday. Sarah Spivey is going to warm up at all today. Hey, good morning, guys. You know, it is going to warm up quite a bit today, but we do have to get through the cold morning and areas of fog, too. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the areas around San Antonio. Now, visibility is perfectly fine in San Antonio. We're looking at 10 mile visibility, but you go out to New Braunfels, visibility down to three miles, visibility down to three miles in Pleasanton, visibility less than a quarter of a mile in Bernie, and temperatures up there in the Hill Country are particularly cold in the mid 30s, even in Del Rio, two and a half mile visibility and temperatures in the mid 30s there as well. Here's a look at where the fog is the thickest. You can see out in Bernie right along uh, I-10 there and then out towards Seguin visibility less than a quarter of a mile too. around San Antonio. Just some patches of fog here and there and throughout the morning today we're going to actually see that fog lift by 10 o'clock. We'll be looking at mostly sunny skies this afternoon 64 at noon 72 for the high temperature southwest winds at five miles per hour. Now in the week ahead, not not only are we going to see our temperatures do some ups and downs, but we also have a chance for some rain. Thankfully, though, no ice in the forecast. I'll detail that rain chance coming up in just a bit. Alyssa, Max. Thank you, Sarah. A disaster declaration now underway for several counties in Texas following the winter weather. Governor Greg Abbott making the announcement just yesterday. The declaration is for seven counties there on your screen. The areas ranging from Austin to Dallas to northeast Texas and even near the Louisiana border. Uh, this move will allow for assistance from local officials to repair damaged infrastructure debris, uh, removal of that debris and damage assessments. Many people north of Bull Verde are still without power this morning. Some residents are trying to come together to pick up tree debris from the freeze that weighed down tree branches, causing many to break and hit power lines. The PEC out outage map shows crews are still working to restore the power north of Bull Verde. Many homeowners took matters into their own hands and started working around the clock to clean up the mess the freeze left behind. All right, and a lot of different areas dealing with the aftermath of this storm in Austin. Well, the Austin energy outage map shows still more than 1500 active outages on the aftermath of this winter weather. Now, widespread power outages in the Texas capital. It's stretching into its fifth day today. City leaders remain unable to say when all the lights will come back on. Obviously, impatience among frazzled, freezing and fed up families in Austin that escalated as milder weather returned. Just on Friday, the newly elected mayor, he stood before cameras. He actually apologized after a week of slow repairs, failed technology and a lack of communication with the public. And according to the Austin Statesman, the Austin City Council will vote on Thursday on a resolution that would direct the city auditor to examine vegetation management and examine Austin Energy's response to this ice storm. Well, happening now, the lights are slowly coming back on in Kamal County. Right now, PEC outage map shows about 1,035 homes and businesses still. They don't have power right now. It sounds like a lot, but it's an improvement less than the last 48 hours when 4,000 homes and businesses were still in the dark. An Asian restaurant had its license suspended last month after health inspectors found multiple violations, including infestation of pests. So the night team's Tim Gerber went behind the kitchen door to re reveal what got them shut down. Chef Joe Asian Cuisine in the 5400 block of Walsham Road barely passed its January inspection with the 73. Ketchup stored at room temperature had to be tossed out. An employee was observed rinsing their hands, but they did not fully wash them. Raw meat was stored above ready to eat produce and other foods were being improperly stored in bins and grocery bags. But it was the infestation of pests that got the business shut down. The inspector suspending their license until they did a 
deep cleaning to remove dead roaches. They also needed to provide proof they are using professional pest control measures to eliminate the infestation. The business appears to have reopened following a reinspection. <laughs> Taqueria Vallarta in the 800 block of South General McMullen Road earned a 79 on their recent inspection. The inspector found beans that were cooked the day before still temping at 70 degrees inside a walk-in cooler. Food in coolers on the serving line was too warm and one unit wasn't working properly. Workers were seen handling food with bare hands. Meat being thawed at room temperature was moved to a sink. The doors of the coolers needed to be cleaned. The floors needed to be fixed and the sides and backs of the equipment needed to be cleaned along with some pipes hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Peng's Chinatown restaurant in the 3200 block of Wurzbach earned an 85 on their January inspection. The dishwasher wasn't properly dispensing chlorine solution. The manager was seen touching pieces of chicken with their bare hands. The hand washing facility in the kitchen was blocked by a rack of food and there was no hot water available at the hand sink in the kitchen. Trays of fried chicken were cooling at room temperature while frozen pieces of chicken were being stored in a cardboard box with no no food grade lining. A bag of cabbage and raw eggs were also found on the floor of the kitchen. The business corrected five violations during the inspection. That's what's happening behind the kitchen door. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. Well, the San Antonio Zoo is a staple of family friendly fun around the Alamo City, and there are big changes on the way. And so joining us in today's leading essay segment is Tim Morrill, CEO of the San Antonio Zoo. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. So, Tim, right off the bat, what are some of the big structural changes people are going to be seeing coming to the zoo? There's a lot of changes going on at the zoo right now. We're really growing and improving. The biggest one that people are going to notice is an all new entrance coming and that construction has already begun. Um, so the zoo is operating with two new entrances. And then in the next 12 months, people will see our old entrance that was built in the 1950s come down and a beautiful grand new entrance that really better represents San Antonio and represents our zoo uh, will be coming out of the ground and open up uh, later this year. Wow, well, that's really exciting. I know a lot of people are probably looking forward to that. And maybe you can also talk about some new exhibits that are on the way. Yeah, we have. We just are opening our John and Grelly Less Butterfly Rainforest. So, we, you know, we had a, a butterfly house that was temporarily built 20 years ago, and now we've built a new beautiful glass butterfly house that can op be open year round. Our Kronkowski Tiny Tot Nature Spot will open fully this year. So we're really excited about that. And then some new species will be coming like meerkats this year and things that we've not had before. So lots of changes <laughs> are happening at the zoo, lots of positive things and lots of excitement being generated here. Uh, we're really excited about 2023. There is so much excitement and not just 2023, but we know there are some big planned projects. You know, what does the full timetable look like? You know, when will the general public see the, the completed changes? Sure. Well, they should see a new front gate this year. So we're really excited about opening that around Christmas time, around the beginning of our Zoo Lights program. The other big thing we have coming online is gorillas. We haven't had a gorilla at San Antonio Zoo since 1991. Uh, we're building a very large habitat, actually designed as the largest habitat in the country. So uh, we're hoping to have up to 10 or 12 gorillas. Uh, I'm really excited about that. That should open early 2025. And then the Kronkowski Tiny Tot Nature Spot and our new butterfly house are opening now. So people can come during spring break or this month and start to experience those things. But lots of big changes coming to the zoo. OK, and on the prevention front, we keep seeing issues at other zoos like the monkey situation at Dallas and the owl in New York City. What precautions are in place to make sure the San Antonio Zoo is safe for guests and, of course, the animals? Sure. So as an accredited zoo and as a, a zoo operator, we're, the safety of the people that come here, the people that work here and the animals is always a top priority. And so, you know, we have security on grounds 24 hours a day. We're monitoring through cameras and people 24 hours a day. Our animal care staff is doing checks of habitats. And so we are really focused on safety. We work very closely with the San Antonio Park Police, the San Antonio Police and the Bear County Sheriff, especially when things like this start happening around the country. We're in very close contact. So. Uh, we're working really hard to keep the zoo safe, keep the animals safe, and um, and to keep operating in a manner where people can feel comfortable coming here and not have to worry about something happening or something happening to our animals. So Valentine's Day just around the corner. Last time I was at the zoo, we talked about the Crimea Cockroach fundraiser. So what do some of those numbers look like? 
So that, that is an annual fundraiser. We started a couple of years ago where you can name a cockroach or a rat or a piece of lettuce after an X. And last year, for example, all 50 people from all 50 states participated and from over 30 countries. And it's the same trend we're seeing this year. We're actually surpassing last year's numbers. Like more people are, are having X's or more people are just aware of our Grimey Cockroach campaign. But it's a great <laughs> fundraiser for the zoo. And uh, we're really excited about what those numbers are going to do to help us fund our mission this year with um, people naming X's after uh, roaches and, and rats after their X's. Oh, that sounds really fun. <laughs> I enjoyed That's the first time I heard of that. And, and I'm also hearing there's a hippo Valentine's Day dinner. If you can talk about that, I'm really interested as well. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot going on at the zoo at, at, at Valentine's time. And so one of the things we have is a, a, a really fine dining dinner experience in our hippo viewing room. And so it's a four course meal with a bottle of wine uh, done by our incredible chef team with some live entertainment, acoustic music. And so a perfect place for a date night, very unique. I'm pretty sure no one else in San Antonio has hippos um, at their Valentine's dinner. So a great experience for couples to come and uh, take part in that. And then we have Meet Your Next Ex, which is a singles night uh, for people to come to the zoo and just have a good time and meet other singles and speed date and things like that. So there's literally something for everybody at San Antonio Zoo in regards to Valentine's Day. All right, tomorrow. thank you so much for joining us this morning. We have all the information on all the events we just talked about right now on KSAT.com. And if anyone missed any of this interview, we're also going to post it on the Leading SA section throughout the morning. Tomorrow, San Antonio Zoo, thank you so much. For now, time is 8-11, 42 degrees out. Go Spurs, go. They're stretched for the... Big, big upcoming rodeo road trip that is underway. We have a full slate ahead. We'll explain in just a bit. And let's take a quick live look out of the Alamo City. The sun is out. Fog still hanging around. 42 degrees now. What is the rest of the day? What does the work week look like? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. Good morning and welcome back. 815, 42 degrees. Sarah Spivey joining us at the desk. So Sarah, a little bit of a warmer start than we saw yesterday, but fog's still an issue this morning. Yeah, and it's warmer by a couple of degrees, so it's still cold out there right now. And fog, even though fog is not around the city of San Antonio, it is in some of our suburbs. So let's go ahead and take a look outside right now with live cam. Can you see on the horizon a bit of haze? That is that fog there that's off in the distance. As we look at the airport, temperatures are in the low 40s. It's sunny and dew points are right there by the temperatures. So whenever you get a dew point right near the temperature and you have calm wind conditions, that allows for some fog to develop. So it is cold this morning. It's freezing in Kerrville, 46 in Rock Springs, 40 in Del Rio, 42 in Pleasanton, 39 in Honto, 41 in New Braunfels. Here's a look at the areas of fog. Visibility in New Braunfels is down to a quarter of a mile, down to less than a quarter of a mile in Gonzales. Perfect visibility registers as 10 miles, so you can see it's easy to see in Kerrville, Rock Springs, Uvalde, and Hondo. But even in Del Rio, visibility down to about five miles. Let's zoom in to the metro area because as you head up in elevation across I-10, visibility starts to go down less than a mile in Bernie. As you look at New Braunfels, less than a quarter of a mile there in Seguin and in San Marcos. And then down near Pleasanton, we're seeing three mile visibility. So slowly we're starting to see the fog lift, but if you're heading out early this morning, perhaps going to church, mass, or even just heading out early for your Sunday, know that you're gonna have to run into some areas of fog around around the valleys and hills around San Antonio. So keep that in mind, drive with us some extra caution. But as you look at your future cast, again, this fog is really quickly going to dissipate. This is a look at around um, noon, and as you can see, sunny skies around noon. All afternoon long, we're gonna be dealing with the sunny skies and temperatures will be warming up steadily. Our average high temperature this time of year is 66, but we're gonna be at 71 in Kerrville, 71 in New Braunfels, 73 in Divide, 71 in Bernie, 73 in Port SA, 71 in Con and here in San Antonio, here's your KSAT 12 hour forecast. Some patchy fog over the next hour or so. 50, uh, 50s for most of the rest of the morning, and then we'll be in the low 60s around noon. Uh, this afternoon, clocking in right around 72. Well, southwest winds at about 5 miles per hour. And then this evening, it's going to become chilly pretty quickly. So. Sun's going to set at 615 by about eight o'clock. That's when we're going to start to see temperatures dip down into the 50s and you'll need that light jacket if you're heading out later on tonight. All right, dew points are comfortable in the 40s and even in the 30s in some places. That's pretty dry, but in the coming days we're going to see the humidity rise. In fact, by Tuesday it's going to be downright humid. 
bad hair day. You're going to feel the humidity, but a front will move through Tuesday into Wednesday. That's going to lower the humidity and another front, a double dose of fronts. That one arriving on Thursday will drop the humidity even more into chapstick territory by the weekend. Those fronts are also going to help our temperatures come down a little bit and they're going to be bringing us a chance for rain. More on that a bit. Let's talk first about the weather setup across the central plains, including Texas. It is quiet out to the east. You may have heard across New England that they were dealing with wind chill values well below zero. Even the coldest wind chill recorded in North uh, in new parts of New Hampshire and Mount Washington uh, felt like negative 109 there. So that cold air mass is going to be moving off to the east, but you can see it's still pretty cold up there well below zero in parts of Canada. Meanwhile, this is the system that's going to be bringing us the opportunity for some rain in that first cold front. So you can see that there's plenty of rainfall across parts of California and the Pacific Northwest. Our rain chances are going to increase Tuesday. We'll have scattered light rain, especially on Tuesday night. We'll have scattered rain and even perhaps a rumble of thunder or two. Then by Wednesday morning, most of that will be moving out of here. But if you're hoping for rain, this is the window you should be looking at Tuesday through Wednesday morning and especially on Tuesday night. Coming up in the next half hour, we're going to talk a little bit about rainfall potential from from that first front that moves through Tuesday night. But until then, it's going to be warm tomorrow with some morning fog, 75 degrees. Then on Tuesday, that's when we'll start off with some morning fog and drizzle. It's going to be cloudy all day on Tuesday with scattered light rain. Tuesday night brings our best coverage of showers and even a storm or two. Wednesday, that rain will be moving out of here and it's going to be cooler. Highs will only be in the 60s on Wednesday and Thursday as we kick off the rodeo. A second more potent dry cold front moves through Thursday and that's going to bring our mornings back down into the 30s afternoons near 60 degrees. No ice in the forecast, but of course I'll be back in the next half hour to talk about potential rainfall amounts Tuesday, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Perfect. Yep. Perfect forecast for the start of rodeo. First yes, rodeo? Yes, first rodeo. Looking forward to it. And Sarah, you mentioned something about humid hair. Should we expect that? This <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Tuesday, most definitely. Tuesday will be very humid and kind of damp throughout the day. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Writing it down. Thank you, Sarah. Time now, 820, 43 degrees out. Dr. Pepper adding a new flavor to their lineup. When to expect the strawberries and cream soda on shelves. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at those ladder numbers. Pick three, five, zero, one, fireball two. Daily four, five, zero, nine, three, fireball two. And we also have the powerball with two, eight, 15, 19, 58, and 10, and the big number is two. Check out this. Dr. Pepper has added a new flavor soda to its permanent lineup. Permanent. So this is not just like a seasonal drink. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, meet Dr. Pepper strawberries and cream. The new flavor will be on shelves nationwide starting this right. month. It will come in a 20-ounce bottle and 12 count packs of 12 ounce cans. All right, so it's gonna be offered in the zero sugar Dr. Pepper. Now this is the only strawberry and cream flavored dark soda currently available. And we were talking earlier, you're in. Right, I'm in, I'm in. It sounds like it's gonna be great. I wonder if they're gonna drop it on Valentine's Day. That makes yes. sense. Yes. Okay, you know, I think we, we need to talk to the producers, have a taste test on air. I, that me, sounds like a great idea. Try it out. <laughs> All right, time now, 825, 45 degrees out. All right, go Spurs, go. It has not been an easy stretch for the Silver and Black, and, well, it's not going to get any easier. Nine games on the road. Our Alyssa Cole covered the unofficial start of Rodeo yesterday, so that means Rodeo Road Trip. What comes next for the Spurs? We're going to explain in just a bit. The big game is almost here, Super Bowl Sunday, and we might all know that big fan who likes to place bets. Oh. Well, coming up in the next half hour, what officials are warning and some Super Bowl safety advice. Good morning and happy weekend. I'm Max Massey. And I'm Melissa Cole. It's Sunday. And we are happy the beginning of this week is here. <laughs> we are so happy. More so the last week is over. No more standing in the, the freezing cold talking about the chaotic exactly. weather. One of the people out there 
Sarah Spivey. Sarah, you were out and about. I have thoroughly thawed from <laughs> that time there. Yeah, uh, you know, it was so cold out there. Of course, lots of ice. People still, still cleaning up from uh, the ice that happened last week. Today's going to be a good day to do any kind of outdoor activities because even though it's foggy right now in places, we're going to have sunny skies, low humidity, a gorgeous day. But visibility in New Braunfels is down to a quarter of a mile because of fog. Good morning in Seguin. Visibility there less than a quarter of a mile. Same story down near Pleasanton, south of uh, San Antonio, and even in Bernie, visibility down to two miles. Now we are starting to see this improve in many places, and it is going to end up being a wonderful day. It's cold out there right now. It's 36 in Bolverde, 41 in New Braunfels. Good morning in Hondo. It's 39, 47 in Divine, 33 in Bandera, 41 in Yavaldi, and it's 42 degrees at Stinson. Here's a look at the forecast for the day today. Again, after this brief time of fog this morning, we're going to be looking at mostly sunny skies and gorgeous weather. 72 degrees for the high temperature today. Southwest winds at five miles per hour. It will get chilly tonight after the sun sets at 615. So what are we going to talk about in the forecast? Well, first we're going to talk about today, a beautiful day, of course. I'm going to get you through your Sunday. But I also want to talk about in the week ahead how temperatures are going to be warm today and tomorrow, but cool in the middle of the week. That's because of a double dose of cold fronts. And that first cold front is expected to bring us at least some rain Tuesday through Wednesday morning. That's our window for rain. I'll show you those details and potential rainfall amounts coming up in just a bit. Alyssa, Max. Thank you, Sarah. Some tragic news. Five members of the same family now laid to rest nearly two weeks after they were killed in a crash in Comal County. In total, seven people dead in the aftermath of this crash. It happened January 22nd near Buffalo Springs Road. Only one survivor, a 12-year-old, Mia Olvera Gonzalez. She was just released from the hospital. She's now in a wheelchair and needs extensive physical therapy. Now her eldest brother, Hector Daniel Jaimez, is going to be her legal guardian. He says he's going to be her mom and her dad, all while drawing on the memory of the parents they both lost. It's a long journey ahead, but I'm going to get through it. No matter, no matter how hard it is, no matter how, how many bad days, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got to do it for my family. Hector says the Department of Public Safety still investigating the crash and how it all happened. According to the initial report, the driver of the other vehicle hit the Jaimez's family's car. A family is without a home this morning after it was deemed a total loss following a fire. Yesterday morning around 10 a.m., firefighters responded to a call around early in the morning on Kimmer Drive, not far from I-10 and East Houston Street. The homeowners were home at the time of the fire and they made it out safely. The fire is believed to have started in bedroom before spreading to the attic. Fire officials say they were able to get the fire knocked down fast, but the home was still left with extensive damage. Now to new details on the shooting of a school teacher in Virginia, allegedly by a six year old student. ABC affiliate WVEC obtaining emails through a freedom of information requests. Now the records reveal the teacher's earlier request for help with the student's behavior in her classroom. ABC's Justin Finch in Washington with the latest details. This morning, new emails obtained by our affiliate WVEC through an open records request detailing first grade teacher Abby Zwerner's struggles to manage the alleged misbehavior of the six-year-old boy accused of shooting her last month. Female victim, she's been shot in the abdomen as well as a through and through into the hand. On November 22nd, Zwerner emails Rich Neck Elementary Administrator saying, I do not feel comfortable with him returning to my classroom today saying the boy stuck his middle finger up to a classmate and pushed another to the ground after bumping into him. Former assistant principal Ebony Parker suggests Werner set up a conference with the boy's father about his behavioral difficulties. Five days later, Zwerner follows up, asking when the unnamed student would move to another teacher's roster. Then principal Brianna Foster Newton says it would have been after meeting with the boy's parents who allegedly canceled. That student remaining on Zwerner's roster until the day she was shot in school January 6th. Her lawyer says administrators failed to take seriously several tips alleging the boy had a gun. Three times school administration was warned by concerned teachers and employees 
that the boy had a gun on him at the school. But the Newport News School District tells ABC News the former superintendent did say at least one administrator was told the boy might have a weapon. The attorney for the school's former principal says it was not her client. Mrs. Newton was unfortunately not one of the administrators who was informed by those in the school that day who had this critical information. The Newport News police chief says school officials also did not inform police about that tip before the shooting. We don't know. We don't know. The death toll is rising in Chile as a result of the raging wildfires. 22 people are dead and more than 550 people are injured. That's according to the Chilean Minister of Interior and Public Security. In the last week, the fire destroyed an area equivalent to what is usually burnt in one year. The country is registering historical high temperatures. Well, a new drug that's shown to slow Alzheimer's disease is on sale, but officials say for most patients, it's still several months away. Experts say the slow rollout of the new drug is due to most insurance plans not covering it. The FDA approved Lakembi back in January for patients with mild or early stages of dementia tied to Alzheimer's disease. A one year's worth of the treatment is set to cost around $26,500. Now, you all probably want to listen to this. There was no winner in last night's Powerball jackpot, so you might still have a chance to win. It's now at $747 million. Monday night's drawing will be the ninth largest in U.S. lottery history and the latest in a string of huge lottery prices. Someone in Maine won a three, what, one, 0.35 billion Mega Millions prize last than three weeks ago, and a California player won more than $2 billion in Powerball jackpot last November. Wow, what would I would do that <laughs> way? May the odds be forever in your favor, and good luck to everyone out there. Of course, and good luck to our Spurs. San Antonio Spurs bidding farewell to the AT&T Center. It was a hard-fought loss to the 76ers the other night, but... It also marks eight straight losses, and now they have nine on the road. The silver and black headed out of town. Not all doom and gloom, though. Rookie Malachi Branham, he's finding his rhythm, scoring 48 points over just the last two games. Here's a fun fact for you guys. He is the first rookie to accomplish that since, you guessed it, Tim Duncan back in 1998. So now Malachi Branham and the rest of the rookies, they get their first taste of the rodeo road trip. A gauntlet, nine straight road games. They're not going to see San Antonio until March 2nd. So we asked Malachi how he felt about it. I don't know what to pack. Um, I know I'm probably going to bring like two suitcases and just, just ask the guys because, you know, they've been on a rodeo trip. So, um, yeah, I don't know what to pack, but I'm probably going to start packing tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be exciting, though. It's going to be exciting. It will be exciting. They're hitting the road for the nine-game rodeo road trip. It starts Monday night, taking on the Bills, and they're going to be going everywhere. They're going, obviously, Chicago, Toronto. I mean, they got to pack extensively. They are. They're also going to Detroit, they too. They are. So go Spurs, go, but let's go Pistons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back here in the Alamo City, San Antonio's Mario Barrios set to make his 2023 debut back here in the Alamo City at the Alamo Dome. Barrios fighting next Saturday, the day before the Super Bowl. He actually has a new training camp in Vegas. His co-trainer, none other than his sister, former pro boxer, Selena. We're, we're putting her in the in the corner, um, mo moving forward, you know, as the, the co-trainer. Like I said, I mean, nobody knows me better, you know, than her. Uh, she's been with me, you know, every step of the way since uh since we first began but you know like I'm, I'm super excited for her you know and, and what what she's doing you know she's uh she's coaching fighters back home in san antonio and um you know i'm just you know it's, it's just nice having you know somebody that you know um having a loved one you know somebody that I've, like, like i said i've been through you know everything with that was such a good story you can see more with mario right now just head to the instant replay page of ksat.com and of course we talked about his fight on saturday well, guess what happens on Sunday? The fan frenzy building ahead of the Super Bowl. Officials, though, they're coming out. They have a lot of warnings. You've got to watch out for scammers. Absolutely. This especially to those who are eager to attend the game and place a bet on it. ABC's Serene Shaw has what you need to know so you don't end up in a scamming situation. 
just one week before the Super Bowl. Officials say you need a game plan and are offering some major warnings so you won't be a loser after the big game. Well, uh, generally scams and involving the Super Bowl specifically do tend to go up year by year. Tickets for Super Bowl 57 are mobile only, and there are only three ways to buy them from the NFL through StubHub, SeatGeek and Ticketmaster. When you're on these websites, a square NFL icon will show that you are buying a real ticket. If if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, When you look at at a website, is the URL misspelled? Is it coming from a website that you actually recognize? And even if you think you're on a legit website, Pennsylvania's attorney general is encouraging everyone to be eagle eyed when buying tickets in order to avoid getting sidelined when arriving at the event. Review your cart before checking out because a lot of resale platforms charge extra fees at checkout. Be very careful of relying on search engines when finding possible tickets. Some scammers are upping their advertising strategies to get more clicks. Don't get stiff-armed by anyone asking for payments through money orders, gift cards, cryptocurrency, or wire transfers. If something does end up being a scam, uh, your credit card can help you charge it back much more easily versus a debit card, which just takes you know directly from your bank account. And with skyrocketing hotel prices ahead of the game, many fans are relying on rentals, but now a huge warning to avoid any potential booking fumbles. Airbnb is warning that if you're going to book an Airbnb home, only pay through their website. All right, so that was Zareen Shah reporting, and you know, we were talking... Who you got, Chiefs or Eagles? I'm going with the Chiefs. I'm going okay, with the Chiefs. Okay. What about you? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it's gonna be a really, uh, it's gonna be a really great game. Sarah Spivey is just staring at yeah. me from across Max, the room. Max, who are you going for? She's uh, right. who our, are you going our for? Sarah Spivey is a huge Chiefs fan. <laughs> You know, through and through, and even before the the Pat Holmes dominance. So, and let's we'll see. admit it, you're a huge Eagle uh, fan. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, very excited, nonetheless. Time now, 8:42, 46 degrees. After the break, a look at some of the trending stories right now on KSAT.com. We'll show you some of the things people are buzzing about. And let's take a live look out at the Alamo City. 46 now. What is the rest of the day? What does the work week look like? Could we see some rain? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. Welcome back. Trending right now on KSAT.com. U.S. agriculture officials, they're proposing new nutritional standards for school meals, and that includes the first limits on added sugars. There's a focus on sweetened foods, things like cereals, yogurt, flavored milk and breakfast pastries. I literally just ate a uh, Pop-Tart, so I don't know if I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here. The plan (laughs) also looking to significantly decrease sodium in the meals served to our country's schools by 2029, while making the rules for foods made with whole grains more flexible. The first limits on added sugar would be required in the 25-26 school year. Now we all know it's important to think about heart health and in just about two weeks, I will be moderating a KSAC Community Town Hall about heart health. It's a KSAC Community event and we will be joined by local experts and healthcare professionals. So please tune in. I would like to personally invite you all to be a part of this event. You'll be able to take away some jewels, some great, great information. You can join on the 16th at 2 p.m. on KSAC.com. Please be a part of the conversation. You can also submit questions. We would love questions from you all. We invite you to submit those questions. Just log on to our website and be a part of the conversation. And speaking of hearts, Sarah's about to make all of our hearts happy because we got some good (laughs) news this week in weather. Beautiful weather today, Alyssa and Max. Now we are starting off with some fog and I wanted to start the forecast by showing you a look from space because the fog looks really cool as the sun is rising from space here. Take a look at your screen. You can see where San Antonio is as the sun is rising. You can see the fingers of the fog throughout parts of the valleys around the coastal plain. Very cool. Now around San Antonio itself, the city, we're not seeing any fog, but as you go outside of the city center, you can really start to see some pretty dense fog and notice across parts of Medina Lake. We're seeing some fog along the lakes as well. So if you've got some pictures of the fog this morning, please post them to our KSAC 
connect feature on our weather app, we can show them on air. It'd be great to see that. Here's another look at the fog when we take it, uh, into account uh, the official weather sites. They measure visibility in miles, and you can see that visibility is down to five miles in Del Rio, but it's down to a quarter of a mile in New Braunfels. And, and as we zoom in a, a little bit further, down to even less than that in Gonzales, down to less than a quarter of a mile in uh, Pleasanton, down to less than a quarter of a mile in Seguin, too. But around San Antonio, we're seeing fine visibility right now. It's cold, though, this morning. Temperatures are in the low 40s, upper 30s, 35 in Kerrville, 44 Rio Medina, 39 in Hondo, 47 in Divine, 41 in Converse, 40 in Seguin, 41 in New Braunfels. Now, today we're going to quickly warm up under sunny skies. That fog is going to dissipate, and it's going to be a beautiful day. Uh, by noon, we'll be in the low 60s and in the afternoon in the low 70s. So sunny and 70. Hard to believe that it was just four or five days ago that we were dealing with a ton of ice out there. This is truly Texas weather to see us back to the spring like day. Temperatures will cool down after sunset into the 50s by midnight. In your neighborhood, this is a look at the high temperatures. The average high is 66 will be at 72 in San Antonio, but it's going to be 75 in Del Rio, 77 along 35 toward Catula, 73 in Hondo, 71 in Kerrville and in the Hill Country, 72 in New Braunfels. Now, tomorrow even warmer we will be in the mid 70s, but Tuesday night into Wednesday, a front is going to arrive. And so the second part of the week is actually going to be pretty cool. Our highs are going to be much cooler than average by Friday and Saturday, struggling to get out of the 50s. Now that front is also going to bring us an opportunity for rain. And here's a look at where the system is right now across the Pacific Northwest. You're seeing a lot of precipitation around this low. That low is going to dig south, place itself just into West Texas by Tuesday. So during the day on Tuesday, we'll have scattered light rain. It's not going to amount to too much during the day, but it's going to stay cloudy with areas of light rain throughout the day. And then by Tuesday night, that's when a front is going to move through and we could see some more organized showers, even a rumble of thunder or two. This is a snapshot at midnight Tuesday night into Wednesday. Now, once again, as is often the case here in San Antonio, we're going to be on the tail end of things. The heavier of the rainfall is going to be up near Texarkana Tuesday through Wednesday morning. But even here, we could see about a tenth of an inch to a half an inch of rain in many spots around San Antonio. Much needed rain at this point with extreme and exceptional drought. And again, that first front is going to allow for temperatures to cool down into the 60s. Second front mornings will be in the 30s and in the upper 50s for the first uh, weekend of the rodeo, guys. Let's go. So you got your first taste of the rodeo yesterday. First taste of the rodeo. Excellent. Looking forward to the rest of the activities. You got up close and personal with the Longhorns. I was a little nervous yes. at one point. Way to yes. go, girl. That's yeah. awesome. Yes, thank you. You crush it. Yes. David Elder out there live, too. He almost made his photographer, Ben, get in the, the pen with the Longhorns. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm an Aggie. <laughs> True. But it, was, it was a lot of fun out there. Even more excited for Thursday. But for now, time is 851, 46 degrees out. Before we head out to break, we want to give a big, big Ooh. happy birthday shout out to a member of our GMSA family, Hardy Meredith. All right. I'm actually teamsing Hardy right as we speak. Hardy produces our 4.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. show during the week. I don't, should we like shout his age out? I don't know. Is that, I feel like well, it's improper. <laughs> there's some big balloons with 40 on it. Well, wow. So Context can. goes, happy birthday, Hardy. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Hardy. <laughs> Last night, some of the GMSA crew celebrated him with a surprise birthday. Hardy is a big Star Wars fan. So the theme was, may the 40s be with you. <laughs> Hardy, we wish you all the best. Happy birthday. All right, in your KSAT 12 hour forecast, a little bit of patchy fog out there right now, but it is lifting as we speak. Around noon, we'll be at 64. Today, we'll have southwest winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Afternoon temperatures look great. Sunny 72 for the high temperature. Get outside, go for a walk, enjoy the outdoors, especially after last week. As we look ahead, warmer tomorrow after some morning fog. Then Tuesday's going to be pretty cloudy with some light rain throughout the day. More substantial rain possible Tuesday night into Wednesday as our first front arrives. Temperatures will be in the 60s for the second part of the week. Another front Thursday night sends us down to even highs potentially in the upper 50s. So a little bit of everything this week, guys. All right. Sarah, thank you. Thank you for watching. Oh, it's cool. Yes, thank, thank you, you for joining us. Part of it. Have a great day. Bye.